I almost died. You almost would have died. I mean, if it's not a big secret, she was headed to Colombia on a one-way ticket. Yeah, my goal quickly shifted to actually just wanting to die and self-destruct. It was like, that was my only goal. And I don't understand how it got so dark so fast. Welcome to the second episode of my podcast. I'm your host, Jay. The name of the podcast is Before We Die, and the logic behind the name is simple. Me and my dear guest today, we're both going to die, and we might as well have an honest discussion about an important topic. And today's topic is addiction and relationships. And my guest today is my ex. And the reason why we're doing this talk today is that, first of all, she happens to be in Estonia, and I just happened to start a podcast. And... We kind of have a very crazy past and our relationship was borderline insane, filled with addiction, drugs, alcohol, sex, crazy fights, ups and downs, and the highs were so high and the lows were so low. Yet here we are still friends mm. and still able to talk and work through things and discuss things. So I thought that it would be great to have her as my second guest on the podcast. So without further ado, here's my ex, C. <laughs> Hi. Hey. Welcome. No. <laughs> no. Welcome to myself. Welcome. Um, no. welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for that introduction. That was very um, accurate. Yeah. Pleasure to be here. In, Are you uh, nervous? No, because it's just like we're having another discussion. It's just we're recording it. But then again, we also used to record it so many times. Before. I'm nervous. Why? It's not. It's not talking to you, but I guess it's. It's not a topic that people really talk about when it comes to let's say drug addiction or relationship problems out in the open and in public so yeah no no that, that's a fair point and also I think that maybe the image that we gave off of people during our travels you know was more that crazy party travel lifestyle couple and like no one had any idea really what was going on like truly behind closed doors and now it's like I guess we're opening up that door and, and sharing yeah. a bit more about like how it actually was and yeah how things were in like in our heads i guess it was a typical instagram situation where on instagram everything is fun and crazy yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. and people are they follow you because i guess they are excited to see that chaos or that borderline you know living on the edge moment yeah but they don't know the cost you, you don't put it you don't put the cost of it on instagram no what it's actually how heavy it is in a relationship or just for two individuals to actually go through that yeah. for such a long period of time. Yeah, I only really showed the good, fun, crazy part. But um, sometimes we put some bad stuff up as well. Yeah, but it wasn't like. Yeah, yeah of course. It, it, it was still the bad, crazy part. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. like the actual, like you and I, our relationship, what I was struggling with, what you were struggling with. Because addictions, I mean, it's not only it's not only the addict yeah. um, that is affected. Like people need to understand that it's there's all the people around the addict that's like enmeshed in their lives that is almost sometimes more can be more affected than what the addict is really going through because i mean addictions is it's such a selfish thing you know yes for the first time in my life i can say i am the victim <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah no but way. but no i'm i don't definitely think i'm the victim but it was it was crazy but just a quick background for for the listeners um we met in mexico which by itself is a fantastic beginning to a relationship. And we were literally together from day one. Literally. We, we met and I kind of took her bag and put it in my room and she stayed. And from that moment on, we lived together and we were in a relationship. Like when I left Estonia, the, the last thing I wanted was a relationship. <laughs> and the last thing I expected to find in Mexico, traveling with my best friend at the time, yeah, was definitely not a girl in, in the picture. I mean, it's interesting, actually. I was just about to say the last thing that I was looking for was for a relationship. Because when I left to Mexico, it was, well... well can you give a quick yeah, background? Yeah, I was, I was going to get into that. The... Um, I was supposed to get married just before I left to Mexico. Like, and this, this we're talking, this was what, 2020? Yeah. 2020. I was supposed to get married in August 2020. And all that relationship went down the drain. Cancelled wedding, everything. And I left uh to mexico yeah in october drugs and alcohol are a big part of were a big part of my life and when i broke up with that guy i really cycled back before even getting to mexico like i cycled 
deep, deep, deep again. And going to Mexico by myself was just like kind of the, yeah, just what I felt like I wanted to do. And it all started so fun and innocent and travel and backpacking and all this stuff. And it, and it just became super dark real fast. Um, if, if we go a little bit deeper into the main topic today, then can you share like what, has been your struggle or what has been your problem with addiction in your life? So since I've been, well, I mean, ugh, this, like, okay, addictions is a very, is a very wide topic, but my main addiction, drug of choice, whatever you want to call it, is alcohol, um, cocaine. But that pretty much, I mean, all drugs were, were kind of there, but yeah, it was alcohol, cocaine. And with all that, often comes relationships, men and everything. Like sex and love is an addiction. I I have this saying where it's like, for me, my addictions is like the holy trinity. It's alcohol, drugs, and dick and men. It's like the three of them go hand in hand. You know, if I drink, I will automatically do drugs and most likely sleep with someone. But then there's also a big difference between sex and relationships. Um... And you were just a beautiful mix of everything in one. <laughs> it was a very evil meetup for us to. It's kind of like you brought out the worst in me and I brought out the worst in you. But at the same time, we kind of brought out the best in each other. Both simulta simultaneously, because we, we had a very weird balance of being there for each other every single day. But at the same time, being destructive for each other constantly. Because, like, it was day number three, you almost saw me, you saw me die. Well, almost, almost died. yeah. Yeah. And that's not a very healthy thing to have at day number three. No, but you know what <laughs> about that day? I remember something, and, and this is where also I recognize my addict's brain and addict behavior and thinking back then. The context was that after a few days we met, we went to this beach called Puerto Escondido in, in Mexico, and we spent the weekend there, and... After a long party, long after party, we went to the beach in the morning and Jay decided to go swimming in the sea, which was apparently one of the world's like deadliest yeah, One beaches. of the most dangerous, dangerous. swimming beaches because it's a crazy surfing beach. Yeah. And I was, I mean, we were, we were pretty fucked. So I, I, I knew that I had nothing to say and that, you know, Jay's the type of guy that will, will do what he wants to do anyways, because I'm like that too. So I was like, okay, whatever. And that quickly turned into a really fucked up situation and he had to be rescued and, and stuff. And I remember that one of my thoughts after that, when you got out, or I don't even remember if I told you, but I was like, I was thinking, <laughs> I made it all about me because I was like, you know, mm, you know, my past, you know, my experience with like the tsunami. I was in the tsunami in 2004 and like the PTSD that I had with all of that, blah, blah, blah. And then, I, and in my head, it was like, and you still went and, and and went in the waves and like you know kind of caused my trauma to come back up you know like it was still all about me i made it all about me where you literally almost died in front of me and my brain was just like like who is this guy like he's just yeah he's doing this to you you know do you know what i mean like that yeah. fucked up twisted thinking where it's like all about me where it's like i almost just watched you die well i, I guess i guess that was like people show you the truth when you meet them the mm -hmm. question is if you notice it because I, I also came out of the water and I was ecstatic. That was the best moment of my travel. Mm -hmm. Like So what... what? Because if you think about where our relationship kind of led to, it was often that the things that I found joy in, which is often fucked up shit, like almost dying, hurt you the most. Mm -hmm. And like the things that I get a high from, you get pain from. And if you put that into a cycle of one year... Uh, it doesn't even need to be anything related to addiction there. That's just a bad cycle to have between people. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter if it's friendship, mom or dad, brother, sister, random stranger. It's a bad cycle. If you add addiction to that and everything that you talked about that you're vulnerable to, plus me as your partner, that's a, that's a shit show. <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, like, like we've spoken before, when we first met, we were both sober as in like you know it was during the day and we hung out during the day and like we actually connected i think based on like the people that Just we talking, are yeah yeah and you know thank thankfully <laughs> that you know we we connected then and not at a party straight away 
But I think the fact that we then partied together, drank together, took stuff together, we realized that, oh, we heightened everything together yeah. and that we also really got along um, when we were completely fucked up because what we were just insane. We would do crazy, crazy things. And we were, I think, kind of feeding off each other's craziness and dark sides. I mean, I know that that was like, obviously I'm not blaming anyone else but myself, but I had found someone that could enable my addictions you know not that you were doing it purpose purposefully but just by being who you were i was like okay with this person i can allow myself to drink as much as i want and go fucking crazy um yeah. and that was what i wanted you know but the thing is that for, for me what what i was drawn to was that i guess i had never met anyone who from from the early beginning i noticed moments where I saw that my my mind went to hitting the brakes before you. And I rarely, if ever, experienced that, that there's someone, especially a female, mm. that wants to push the boundaries further than I do. And I was super attracted to that. The crazy part, I guess, is that you were also open about that you had problems with addiction in your past. But in my mind, I just had a very shitty understanding of what, addic what addiction is because I don't have any one-on-one, -on -one, I, I don't have any family member or like mom dad grandparents or or something well grandparents probably everyone drinking in estonia like mm -hmm. fucking crazy but i didn't just understand if you told me i have issues with alcohol or drugs in the past i just portray the word addiction as in as i understand it which was just a superficial understanding of mm -hmm. like how i would do it because for me i can just stop whatever i do i can do i know i can do heroin and stop I've never done it, just to be clear. But I know I can't do it because I'm not that addictive person that gets really easily into heavy addiction or something. I can go in, get out. And I also projected that on you. I kind of saw it as a mental weakness. Mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> For me, it was really selfish and stupid to, I mean, do what I did because if someone tells you, yeah, I have issues with this, and then you're like, okay, cool, let's go party. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think I told you from the start. Or at least because, I mean, I, I know... Yeah, myself. maybe it took a long time. It was week two. No, but I mean, <laughs> you know, like fucking addicts, like we're, we're really smart at wording things. And I, I know now and looking back, you know, with hindsight, I, I definitely know that part of my character, especially when I'm interested in someone, can be like very manipulative. And I definitely know that um, I, use, I use my assets to get what I want. Assets. <laughs> right? And especially, and I'm also really good at, at manipulating in the sense that, you know, especially when it comes to drugs and alcohol, I might not have told you from the start, like, yeah, by the way, like, I'm an addict in a full-blown relapse, like, I was cycling hard, you know, but I probably worded it and, and such by saying, oh, yeah, like, I went to rehab when I was 21 and, like, really downplayed the whole thing. And even if, hypothetically, I said, like, yeah, you know, this is what's going on. Like, right now I'm just in this full-blown party mode. Like, I'm an alcoholic, I'm an addict. It's like, I don't think that people will have believed that at face value, like, at first, you know? Because also you see me, this, like, solo female backpacker, like, you know, doing my own thing, really open, really fun, really all this, and you just cannot associate the label of alcoholic or addict to that. Yeah. You know, it's just impossible. And that definitely, if, if I think of a word addict someone like you doesn't come to mind mm. especially given that you also have a degree in psychology <laughs> yeah right so it's like everything is kind of the opposite of that and also if i guess i guess i did the same thing that i often give advice to other people like be aware of this if you're attracted to someone you will amplify the qualities that you need mm. and you will shut your eyes with the qualities that are you know right up like dangerous mm -hmm. But it doesn't serve you, so you're just going to be like, oh, it's fine. It's like, oh, yeah, my husband beats me, but now nah, he also, you know, puts bread on the table. Yeah, yeah. but he fucking beats you. Yeah. And with us, it was like, I think if, even if you would have been straight up day one, by the way, I'm an addict, I would have been like, oh, yeah, cool, but you push my limits. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so it's, 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 a weird, it's a weird balance, I think. But I wanted to say about addiction, because I think addiction is like a word that... Not that it gets tossed around a lot, but everyone kind of has an image of it, which I think is extremely distorted. Mm. In the same way that I use the word drug, right? Yeah. What's a drug? 
legal drug, illegal drug. Mm -hmm. And heroin is a drug, MDMA is a drug, cocaine is a drug, alcohol is a drug. And I know people listening, a lot of people went like, alcohol is a drug. Mm. No, it isn't. It's legal. Mm -hmm. Just because it's legal doesn't mean that it's not a drug. And just because it's liquid and you drink it with your buddies and with your family, it doesn't, does not make it not a drug. Mm -hmm. Food can be a drug. Sex, sex can be a drug. Yeah. Coffee is a drug. So I just wanted to talk about the definition of addiction, which yeah. for me, for me is, mm -hmm. is, uh, it's behavior that you know is destructive to something that's best for you. Yet you do it anyways and yeah. repeat it anyways. It starts hurting you, people around you, and yet you repeat it over and over and over. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just to clarify on 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 the definition of addiction, it's well, first of all, it can be substance or it can be a behavioral addiction, right? So, like you said, drugs, alcohol, sugar, whatever, all that is substance, um, like a product related yeah. addiction. And then there's all the behavioral addictions, which is can be exercise, sex, you know, like gambling. Well, gambling is but both, you know. It's like so. There's really different different types but it's still under the same umbrella it kind of takes over your life and it impairs your daily functioning i'm not saying that like because there are so i mean i didn't used to drink every single day i didn't used to take drugs every single day however when i was in that loop of being an active addiction and this is where like terms get like loosely thrown around but when i was in active addiction but sober so for example i don't know i wasn't drinking for a few days because i was waiting for the weekend but even during that time, I didn't have the mental clarity that I have now in recovery, you know, yeah. when I'm when I'm working on myself, when I'm, yeah, working on myself, basically. And so my daily functioning back then in active addiction, even when I was sober or not using, was completely fucked because my brain was just twisted from that loop, that cycle that I was in, which was active addiction. I hope that made sense. Kind of. I mean, most things in addiction don't. So yeah. <laughs> that's, that is my two cents in addiction was that like I became absolutely powerless. Like I don't think I'm a weak person at all. I'm a mentally strong and I just had never encountered something so chaotic that it like almost pulled me under. What, like me? Yeah. It's not, it's not you. It's the addiction part in you. Yeah. Because it's so unpredictable. It's so mm. unpredictable that it becomes predictable in a way that I know that I can almost get anything out of any situation. Like, mm -hmm. bam, and then you're there. And that's kind of exhausting because it puts you on a constant level of, like, ready, like, like stress, I guess. I mean, the fucked up part is that I enjoyed it because it was a challenge for me because I was like, oh, never encountered that. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, even when we left Mexico and we moved to England, it was still, like, I think it was even more difficult when you cut the drugs and you cut the alcohol. Yeah. And then it continues. The yes. unpredictability continues and everything, like your brain becomes more clear and then you actually see your partner and then you see the addiction or the addict part mm. way more clear. Mm -hmm. And that was the difficult part because then you're like, oh my fuck. Yeah. I don't know what to do anymore. Yeah, yeah. And before before we transition into that, it's just... I wanted to say also like a few defining terms when we got to Manchester. So this is a really long story, but when we got greatest city in the world, by the way, <laughs> moved there for sure. Yeah. During the winter, right after Costa Rica. Yeah. Um, when we were in Manchester and we first signed that 30 day contract of no alcohol, yeah. remember? So I hadn't gone back to 12 step fellowships and like I hadn't gone back into recovery. Mm. I was dry. That's what we consider dry. It's like I'm, I'm not using but I'm not in recovery. Yeah. And that is like one of also the most fucking dangerous things for like, well, an addict because I was, I was waiting for the next time I was going to drink and that was going to be, well, when I went to Paris, like now looking back, of course I was fucking bullshitting myself above everyone else. Um, because yeah, I, I did want to go to Paris and I did want to completely fuck myself up. Like I hadn't had a drink for 30 days, not because I wanted to, but because we had signed that contract, Yeah, you know? And so it was like my next drink, it was going to be like a big one. And then after that, like completely messed up weekend and all the stuff that went on with us, when I actually went, got back into recovery, that's when my real recovery started. Because first of all, I needed to be back in recovery. It's like it was so I was in so much pain when I was drinking and I was in so much pain when I was not drinking that I was like, there is clearly a problem. And also the other thing is 
what I really realized this time, because I used to be sober when I was younger and then I drank again and stuff, is that I could never, if I enjoyed my drinking, it's because I wasn't controlling it. And that's when things went completely haywire, right? But if I controlled my drinking, which was rare, but I could on certain occasions, I never enjoyed it, you know? And it's the same with like the drugs. If I had to control the number of whatever I took, I didn't enjoy it because it's like, well, the fun of it was not limiting myself. And then like when I didn't control it, that's when I enjoyed it because it was that's what I was seeking, that complete like complete just blackout, which is so contradictory because like, why would anyone seek a blackout? Why would anyone want to get to that point where you don't even remember what you're doing and you're just completely fucked? But it was like that was that for me was the first time, I think, when something hit me. Where I understood that we can have a discussion about a topic, but our fundamental understandings of why we do things are so different mm. that like there was a moment when you told me for the first time that you don't drink to enjoy yourself in the sense that, let's say I go out, I take my two, three gin tonics, whatever. Mm -hmm. But like there were nights where your goal was literally drink until you could to black out. Yeah. And then when I saw that, because, like, I had never seen anyone, a girl, drink like that. Mm. In the way, like, we were out and we had a discussion. We literally had a face-to-face -face discussion. Like, hey, like, you should take it slower. It's, like, 10 o'clock. Chill. Mm. You're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you go and five minutes later, you're just chugging from a bottle. Mm. Like, seeing that was crazy as fuck. And that's the thing, because also at that moment... At that moment when we would talk about it or when I would say like, yes, okay, like I'm going to take it easy tonight. I'm only going to have X amount of drinks. I genuinely meant it. I oh, yeah, that, genuinely that's, meant that's it. That's the crazy part <laughs> yeah. because I saw it in you that you weren't lying to me. Yeah. But it's just that the addict part is almost like so present that you can be honest right here. Mm. But as soon as you move away from this situation... There's a new situation and everything that was in the past doesn't matter. It's yeah. just how you feel and what you want in the moment. So you can tell me right now, yeah, yeah, because you're talking to me and I'm your partner and you do care for me. You're going to be like, of course, I understand. Like, I'm going to take it slower. And then when I'm not there, then there's a bottle. And then you have the same relationship with the bottle. I mean, you're here. Of course, I'm going to drink you. Well, yeah, it's as soon as I have that first drink. And that's why they say like one is too many and a thousand never enough. Because yeah. it's like as soon as I have that first drink, that first line, that first whatever... All else goes out the window, despite yeah. me, despite the promises that, that I made. And it's like the voice inside my head is like, no, no, no. But you guys had this talk. Like you said that you'd only have one drink. And then and then it's like there was always like a reason in my head to, you know, either sneak another one. And then sometimes I would also want to turn that voice off. So I would drink more, like take a shot or whatever to like get fucked up, to forget it. And then be in like that, that just like reckless, careless mode where it's like, oh, fuck it. And that was like what I was also seeking is just that like complete carefree mode. And I don't think there's, I mean, this is going to sound fucked up, but I don't think there's anything wrong if an addict wants to be in that, you know, fine, do it, fuck yourself up, destroy yourself up, but don't bring other people in, in, in the picture with you. And I think that that's the selfishness of the addict that we go back, that we were talking about in the beginning. It's like, if I wanted to just fuck myself up, I should have never entered that relationship with you. Or I should have never taken it to where it went because like my goal had then shifted to only just fuck myself up. And it was really selfish of me to well bring you at this point who already cared about me into that whole equation because then it was affecting you more than anything else to see, I guess, myself destroy myself and you not be able to do anything about it. Yeah. Well, as we're talking... um. I kind of feel like we're talking about you as in the destroyer of the world and me, the poor little lamb that got sucked into this big chaos. But it's <laughs> just to be clear, I was equally, I was equally like, I have my demons. Yeah. And the, the crazy part is that our demons kind of made, you know, both of our demons surface at the same time. When yeah. you're at your worst, I'm going to be at my worst. Mm. And those were, I guess, the worst moments that we had. Yeah, that's all also which was all like really fun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, at some point it wasn't fun anymore. It it became yeah. like really dark. It was dark. It was dark. Yeah. And I don't have a problem with addiction. Or so they say. But if I go to my dark mode, 
I'm also only about me. Mm. I guess my point is that I don't want you to be portrayed as if you were the aggressor in the relationship. Yeah. It was equally destructive. Yeah, no, I, I mean, <laughs> it's funny. It's so fucked because like, ugh, when we were together in the beginning, everything was fine. But then like when things started getting complicated and dark in my head, you were the aggressor. Right. And all I could see was how you were doing me wrong and like you're so bad and you're so this and that. Yet I stayed in the relationship or I mean, I did try to leave a few times, but that's another story. And then when we were in that like middle part, I guess in Manchester and stuff, I was starting to realize like, oh, fuck, like I am, I'm the issue, you know, like I'm, yeah, I'm really fucked. And then like now that I'm properly in recovery, I had just seven months a few days ago. <laughs> yeah. It's like. Because now, now I almost see myself as I, I'm the aggressor. And I guess that's why I'm talking in this manner. Because like I'm doing so much work on myself. And I'm really looking at things from yeah this recovery point of view. And it's like, yes, there were so many times where you did me wrong. And like that was lots of fucked up situations. But, but it's like the way I see it now is, yeah, my, my addictions really was the... Mm, was was yeah was what kind of drove our relationship but it's a good reminder for you to say that no we were there were two equal parts i have yeah. to also like i think we both enabled each other to 100%. be at our worst yeah we we were just dating our worst sides our yeah. shadow sides were just together yeah it was a lot of fun though <laughs> <laughs> and that's yeah. the i mean the crazy part is that being being in there wasn't necessarily that horrible when you got the moment of clarity yeah Right after it, that was the horrible period. But now looking back at it, I'm glad that it's an experience in my life. We we broke up three months ago. March, April, May, June, yeah. Yeah, but it, but before before that, it was kind of not a long time coming, but it was just a process that needed to be done yeah. extremely carefully because because there was, I mean, there's just a lot of uncertainty when, I mean, talking from my perspective, when you have like fear or responsibility for your partner's life is it doesn't feel like a choice in the moment mm. it's like okay this is getting out of hand well i'm just gonna leave and then you're gonna be alone what are the chances that you're gonna relapse and get back into all the horrible shit it's like okay then i can't leave then i have to stay if i stay then i'm gonna destroy myself so what's the option? Well, I'm going to try every single solution that has worked for every single person that I've given advice to in my life. That didn't work. Like the worst moment literally was I had a realization probably after a big fucking fight we had in Manchester when I understood that my biggest power that I have, which is words, talking to other people, mm -hmm. making them understand or like drawing them into my position or my perspective, then something in their head goes like poof. And then we were in the same boat. I couldn't do that with you because you were so driven by emotion and how you felt or like a like an emotional drive that you could understand my words for maybe like three minutes. And then two hours later, it was gone. Mm. And that made me feel extremely powerless because there was. How do you communicate with someone that doesn't understand words? Well, that's the thing. I was just running on. Yeah, just on my emotions you know, and my feelings. And I think recovery, you know, it, it stands for like recovering your mind, your body and your soul, because it's like, I'm finally thinking again, I finally have some 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 kind of clarity again. You know, I'm, I'm recovering my mind from from all of that, I'm getting it back. And what you said about like being being powerless with your words, it's like, it, yeah, I was just driven by emotions so even though we had a super deep meaningful conversation at some point and i was like oh my god yes like i'm really gonna change blah 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 like as long as i wasn't in recovery you know it didn't matter because i just yeah i didn't have the tools or i didn't want to have yeah. the tools to to properly like get out of that cycle like one one thing that i started to notice or what i see now or what i would say that recovery recovery gives you is that moment of pause between a thought and a decision mm. because when you're at your let's say the addict behavior there's almost like a thought action mm -hmm. immediately there's there's no due process in between or thinking like whether i should or shouldn't it's just like bang bang yeah 
and it's super difficult super difficult to get you to pause and think mm. now just i haven't properly thought about manchester but it was it was tough it was really fucking tough in the beginning like being back in oh, it was tough on every level yeah when you take it just recovery or relationship mm. we completely fucked up our dopamine baseline in mexico so we woke up to an insane <laughs> expectation of dopamine from yeah. the day and then it's like well how can you climb there boom drugs alcohol sex all that crazy stuff right and that was our constant day we had days when we partied seven days a week probably eight days a week yeah and going from there to manchester <laughs> yeah. gray shitty industrial city like like just just because of the weather it mm. hits your body hard oh for when sure. you become sober in mm. that environment oh you get clarity and you see every, you, you see where you are and you're also like oh my god you know yeah. part of you wants to go back to mexico yeah and i guess <laughs> it was the best worst choice where to go thank thank god for cristiano ronaldo for <laughs> signing to manchester united so i decided to go there for a season yeah, thanks cristiano yeah but wait i just i was just laughing <laughs> earlier on because like i just remembered of something that we would do remember five htp yeah like we would take that, which is, it, it's basically like, how would you describe it? It's like, it's a, like a food supplement, yeah. but it, re, it kind of restores your, I think it was like dopamine serotonin levels or yeah. something like that. But it's like, <laughs> we took it, what, like we bought one bottle, I think at one point in Playa, which we shared. Yeah. And it's like, how could we have expected that one bottle to actually, you know, have an effect given all the partying that we did before and all the partying that we did after. <laughs> well, like, that's another thing. It's like, like what? I think a lot of the things that we did didn't make sense. No. And <sighs> I stopped making sense for myself. Yeah. And that was the moment where I really realized that, well, I am, I'm really damaging my brain and mm -hmm. I don't, I don't even understand what I'm thinking anymore. Mm -hmm. And like, like a great example, great example. So we were still kind of trying to be healthy. We, we even took a gym membership in Mexico oh, and took fine. like a, almost yeah. a month off from partying and everything. It was like, yeah, let's go do four pull-ups and then <laughs> yeah. and then go absolutely insane for the yeah. next two months. Yeah. So we were kind of like pretending to be healthy and took a took a break. Yeah. But it was just a build up for the next it, literally, craziness. Literally. And during those periods, <laughs> we bought like vitamins and everything. <laughs> yeah. And then we had vitamin C, right? Yeah which is my favorite kind of vitamin. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I remember it was like an, we had like a party or something. It was like a calm down day. Yeah. And I took the vitamin C. And the next day I felt kind of worse. Yeah. And my brain went like, oh, fuck this vitamin C. Yeah. It's, it's bad for my health. Yeah. And the fact that it's funny and stupid now, but yeah. in that moment that my brain thought it's a great idea to give that thought yeah. and me actually saying it to myself and believing it. Right. <laughs> right. For like two seconds, I actually believe, believe that claim. Yeah. You're drinking way too much alcohol. Mm. You're not sleeping. You're doing all of the alphabet of drugs. <laughs> you are in a destructive relationship. You're just completely destroying your body. And then your mind goes like, it's the vitamin C. Yeah, it has to be. It has to be the vitamin C. Because it's Mexico, so yeah. you, know, you don't know what they put in the vitamins. We even said that <laughs> yeah. to each other. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't trust the Mexican yeah. vitamins. No. And the other, the other thing was also the good thing that we say is like, with, with the drugs, it's like, when you felt like shit, yeah. it was like, oh, we probably, you know, did too much or we didn't do enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we fucking got more tattooed on our finger after two weeks of knowing each other, like the yeah, word more. That kind of... That just describes it all. Yeah. But it, it's, it's, like, a, it's a good uh, it's a good word to have that too because it can represent more of, well, the party drug craziness that re yeah. they represented there. It represented the limitlessness of what we were doing. Mm. But now it represents more recovery, more four walls and productivity yeah. more running every day more taking care of your health yeah, so no, it's no, like what sure. you aim at Definitely. and then afterwards we go back to mexico <laughs> no fuck that colombia yeah pick up where we left off <laughs> no but like also when you were talking about playa and stuff i remembered something like remember when i got sick well sick when i had um to take some antibiotics for something 
and then I got like this allergic reaction. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So long story short, I got an allergic reaction to f- a fucking medi- medication that I got in Mexico. You didn't get any allergic reaction to any drug. Uh, like you right? See? I was like, what the fuck? And I <laughs> and I had these massive blisters on like my foot, on my neck, on my body, and everything. And that didn't stop me from going out and taking oh, drugs and drinking. That was crazy because she lit- literally had like an she had like a blis- blister, like a huge one under the chin yeah and then it popped oh, uh, and then it was like an open wound literally and she put like a, a plaster like a plaster on it because we had to go party of course <laughs> of course and then she was like no i don't want to put it you know it looks fucking ridiculous yeah. i'm like dude you have an open wound literally i remember that night yeah and even the fact that i'm saying like dude you have an open wound put the plaster then we go <laughs> that's <laughs> that's fucked up yeah and then we go to the party and she just goes like pulls it off and then you're in an open environment oh, with like it was it's just the the amount of carelessness mm. towards our bodies and health and mind and everything it was just fucking awesome yeah it was great <laughs> no but it was so fucked i mean like no, it's, it's it's extremely freeing i yeah. mean it's probably the freest moment i've ever felt in my life where i didn't have to think because like my burden is my brain and my brain is always on and it feels like 10,000 car lights straight into my eyeballs 24-7 yeah. when I wake up. So having this brainless moment of party and just like, oh, I'll just I'll just become a stupid person for a little while. Mm-hmm. I did end up doing the stupid shit that I would normally see from the side and be like, people, what are you doing? You're yeah. doing stupid shit. But being part of that is fucking awesome because if you're stupid, the only person who doesn't understand you're stupid is fucking you. Mm. But how did we have the fucking determination to sober up go to manchester and then start to like unknot and not one by one yeah and eventually like end up being here talking about stuff not fighting not being at each other's throats and also not having sex by the way slept in the same bed yesterday Mm. totally platonic and we're just really really i mean it was really hard literally (laughs) <laughs> but it was like, it's just mind over matter it's the opposite of what we used to do impulse action yeah. impulse action and now it's like no 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 yeah i mean our relationship wasn't just based on like super dark addiction yeah. stuff it was like yeah good stuff as well and i think that's why also we're able to forgive each other and understand that back then was okay a part of us but you know it's not it's not us and it's, I think it's beautiful also how we both managed to get out of that cycle or at least, I'll, well, no, I was going to say I'll speak for myself, but yeah, how we both got out of that cycle and we didn't just leave one behind, you know, because yeah. you could have very well just been like, well, fuck this bitch and all her craziness. Like, I'm going to go get my shit together. But all oh, the times I was thinking about many, many things. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's like if, like I said, I know that I don't owe my recovery to you, but like you were one of the big stepping stones for me and like if you hadn't told me that one day kind of had you kind of had an ultimatum on me it was like it's me or the bottle i don't know if you remember that day in manchester but you were like of course yeah you have to kind of i mean i wrote down conditions and everything and it wasn't conditions like option a b or c right yeah option a b and c Mm -hmm. or it's like it's just done because i i did that because i figured out the answer to i figured out the answer to the question that i was tackling Like, I have a very problem-solving mind. And the issue was that solving a problem that I don't know anything about is extremely fucking difficult. I didn't know anything about addiction. I didn't know anything about being in a relationship with with an addict. Mm -hmm. And trying to figure it out on your own is just insane. Because part of it is also quite confident. Like, oh, yeah, of course I can do it. It's like, ah, no, you can't. Mm -hmm. Like, you cannot. Yeah. And then why I gave you the ultimatum was that I mean, I don't, I'm not a big fan of ultimatums in the sense like with, within relationship to other people, but I understood that if words don't work with you, I was mm-hmm. like, okay, what the fuck works? Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, you're driven by impulse and emotion. Mm-hmm. And it was like, okay, I don't want to give you an ultimatum, but I do know that you care for me. I do know that you're scared of being alone mm-hmm. and I just got to go through your emotions. So you have an impulse of making the right choice. So I put myself on the line being like, okay, here's the ultimatum. It's me or the bottle. And it was like, I think the conditions were that you have to go to AA daily meetings 
we have to well there were other things we like don't I don't know if we can talk about it here or no, but I can't remember. Fin Dom. Oh right. Yeah, yeah, because I mean yeah, we, we did get sidetracked into yeah, a lot of this stuff. Fin Dom and and Chicker Dieting and <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> many, many things were there. And it yeah. w- it was like you just gotta go <laughs> all in or all out with something. And I guess I figured that if I set you an ultimatum like that because I know you're you're also driven by fear and you don't want to be alone, especially in that moment. And when you have that moment mm. of clarity, you can have that impulse of like, not that I don't want to lose him, but like, oh shit, I'm going to be alone. Mm-hmm. And even if it's not the best thing to trigger in you, it made you make the right choice. And then afterwards we could build like actual daily structure of, of a better, healthy, healthy lifestyle. But mm-hmm. like the initial push that you called the ultimatum, that was... It was a manipulative move, but it was like, I don't think being manipulative is a bad thing. You can also manipulate someone into not killing themselves. That's not bad. You can manipulate someone into making a better choice for themselves that they don't see. Mm. So manipulation is just a tool that can be used for bad things, but it can use, also be used for positive things. And like what, one thing on manipulation and stuff, because I remember now looking back, I remember how I considered you to be such a manipulative person. And I thought that, yeah, you know, I was really under, I was like your victim, yeah. you know, I was like, okay, he's a narcissist, he's a sociopath, a psychopath, all of that. And I was like, and I'm the little victim. And um, what I really realized at some point towards the end of Manchester, or at some point in Manchester, I don't remember when, it's like, when you gave me that ultimatum. And I started getting better, even though there were slips and stuff, and like, you were still there. I was like, oh, like he actually really cares for me. And then even when we broke up, all of that still continued till today. I think that is the true definition of I don't even know what the word is, but like care, maybe like genuinely caring for another human being or like like a genuine connection or like even maybe love, but not even in the romantic sense, but just in that yeah. like pure form. Like, like he, there was... There was something in you that I always was drawn to that was nothing related to the, like, pushing the limits and everything. It was just, like, I just saw so much unfulfilled potential in you. And I also saw that you were struggling. Not struggling, but, like, the good part of you was, like, almost dead in many moments that we were together. Mm-hmm. And it was totally controlled by by the alter personality, let's call it. But even the more that raised its head, the more I felt like, like, fuck that. Like that 0.1% that's somewhere there. I know mm-hmm. it's there. Yeah. I don't know. It just made me extremely determined to not give up because like, it's me. I authentically don't put in that much effort into relationships with other people. Mm. I don't do girlfriends. I don't do any of that stuff. And mm-hmm. the fact that you somehow pulled that side out of me, like you kind of pulled it out with the chaos, like, <laughs> here I am and I was like oh oh shit and then I got to know you and that sweet side of you is actually really 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 rare Mm. and I also saw like how you're just hurting yourself and you just don't know how to stop that yeah and I kind of knew if if I'm not gonna do it nobody will yeah that's exactly what I was gonna say it's that like I at some point I understood that that yeah you weren't giving up on me yeah and getting a bit emotional but yeah like that you weren't yeah you weren't giving up on me and even like when since we broke up it's like yeah you you, you're still there like i know that i can well you've made me understand that i can i can literally count on you like you'll have my back if i need it whenever and yeah and that's like for me i guess it's one of the rare things that i've never really had in my life because like men have always kind of just well I been mean, absolute dickheads to you since you were young yeah which is like includes my father who's passed now but well but he managed quite a lot before he passed yeah but yeah i remember when when we were still together Aww. then you often not often but there was a moment when you told me that part of you is afraid of that I'm going to solve your problems and once like it's solved, I'm going to leave. Yeah, I remember that. Which is a very vicious cycle because the solution to keeping me next to you is mm. to constantly create more problems. Mm. 
And I also, Which is a great strategy, I gotta say. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's completely fucked and manipulative of my end. But yeah. I also remember, this is the completely fucked up part, that like I didn't want to, I was scared of getting back into recovery because I knew that that I might have a risk of like losing you. Keeping, if I kept myself in that cycle of like fucked upness, I know that you would still be there. But like getting back into recovery, I was like, fuck, I'm pretty sure that like we're not going to be together once I get into recovery. We had, we had several moments where I understood how this distorted your view of life. <laughs> life or like even yeah. me was in the moments where I was like, what more evidence do you need? Like, I'm still here. I could have left a billion times. I haven't. Like all the evidence on the table. There you go. But it's not enough because emotions override every single piece of evidence when mm-hmm. emotions overtake you yeah and like you're a very very highly neurotic person mm-hmm. and i remember when we did the uh, fight trade personality test and then you had well my agreeableness was like one percentile yours yeah. was like three mm-hmm. your neuroticism was 98 <laughs> mine was like seven yeah and it was so good to do those tests yeah, by the way, if we're talking about tests that Jordan Peterson also promotes a lot, which is, I think it's understandmyself.com. Mm, yeah, know. or you go to just jordanbpeterson.com and you can find it from there. Who we're going to see tonight, by the way. Yeah, Jordan Peterson is in Tallinn today. We're going to go and see him talk in like a couple of hours. But anyways, you can also put your results together and then it gives you like relationship advice. And <laughs> the test said that if you have a partner that's extremely low in agreeableness and extremely high in neuroticism... <laughs> That's really, really bad or difficult. Yeah. And then it said, plus, there was something else. I, th- I don't think it was conscientiousness, but something else. Then is, if also that, mm. then it's like, oh, my God, be aware. Yeah, just run. And then basically. I looked at your results. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was all of that. But in a weird way, it's uh, in a weird way, everything kind of worked. It just balanced. It, it, it still kind of felt in all of its chaos, it was still balanced. And like, and here we are, because I think. Not many people do that mm. or even are interested or capable of doing that. Even if they're interested, they just cannot because mm-hmm. it's so much hard work. It's so much hard work that like mm-hmm. I know that what we went through is not normal. No, 100%. Yeah, at all. And I also know that how we got out of it is not normal. And, yeah. and where we are now talking about it is also not normal. I mean, look, we're fucking, we're fucking recording a podcast. Do you know what I mean? Like, normal yeah. people don't even record pod, like, let alone exes record. But a this podcast. is this is what I I never understood the concept of not getting along with your exes or you break up because you still kind of build a relationship with a person. You care for them and everything. Just because you break up doesn't mean that they're worthless or meaningless to you. I think it just means that the decision was made made based on emotion and impulse. Maybe you got hurt. Maybe they cheated on you, and then you go like. Bam, you cheated on me and go fuck yourself. We cheated on each other. Here we are. <laughs> yeah. Was it easy to work through that? No. But we did it. Mm. Well, you cheated more on me than I did. So. Bullshit. <laughs> no, it's not bullshit. I only cheated once. No, you didn't. Yes, it did. No, you didn't. Yes, it did. Yeah, but maybe we did. Okay, fine. The, the, I think we have a different, yeah, different, different definition, definition of cheating. Of cheating. Yeah. yeah. Oh, every time I looked at another girl. Okay, no, then it's like 4,724 <laughs> times. No, no. The highs that we had, right, they were great, but you don't really connect to people. And I don't think you can have a strong relationship or a great relationship just because of the positives and highs. You connect to people with your problems. Mm. If someone understands your problems, they're going to be the friend. They're going to be the the person who you need the most when you're at your lowest. Mm -hmm. Because nobody can actually care for you. When they don't understand your problem, let's say with you, if someone doesn't understand addiction, they can't can't really be there for you because they don't know when to be there for you. And if anything, they're going to give you the opposite direction advice Yeah. when they don't understand addiction. And with addiction, it's usually like, what do you mean you can't drink one beer? Mm-hmm. Just have one beer because yeah. they think that they can have one beer. Yeah, yeah. So can you. That's kind of like saying to someone that has allergy to peanuts and it's one, like just yeah. have one peanut it's fine i can have 10 peanuts you can have one right mm-hmm. but it's not it's like it's just bad advice and yeah you connect to people in your problems and in all of the craziness and and i would even say thanks to the addiction and thanks to the drugs and party and all the craziness we did we opened 
up to each other in a way like you saw my craziest, worst, darkest side that nobody, no, well, not nobody. Nobody has seen it up and close like that. Mm. And you still stayed. And I also saw yours. And once you have that, I've seen your shadow side mm. and you've seen my shadow side. Even though you're supposed to run, something is like, something also locks you in because you know that it's very difficult to get that with anyone. Nobody wants to open up. People don't even want to talk about the most superficial problems that they have. Mm. Like what I always like to say about you was that the trauma that you've had in your past, mm -hmm. like people are like, okay, my parent died. I'm extremely traumatized, right? Crazy mm -hmm. shit. Oh, by the way, I was in a tsunami when I was a kid, traumatized. Oh, by the way, my parents split, traumatized. Oh, my little brother died, traumatized. Oh yeah, I'm, I went to rehab when I was like 20 or something, traumatized. Uh, did I miss something? Yeah, you've had all of those things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, in a weird fucked up way, what I saw in you was like one of the strongest people I've ever met because you should not be alive. Mm. Like people commit suicide for 4% of what you've been through. Yeah. And it's like, you're still here, still going and, and you drinking and everything and all of that, it kind of made sense to me because that was the only solution that you had found to numb the pain that just life put you through that you didn't even choose because you were so young. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like, also now looking back on things, it's like, well, of course, I had the perfect set of cards that were dealt to me to become an alcoholic and an addict, you know? Yeah. Like, it was just, it was... Just straight from the book. Yeah. And, like, the funny thing is also, I think, with addiction and addicts is that, like, we're very capable... I mean, I'll speak for myself once again. Like, I'm very capable of, like, dealing with the big things, you know, like, the super big life things. Like, yeah, yeah the big trauma, my dad dying, like, all of these things, blah, blah, blah. But then it's like when it comes to smaller things, like, I don't know. OK, a breakup can be a big thing, but like just the smaller day to day things like fucking dealing with taxes or like a bank appointment that it feels completely unmanageable. Like it feels like so overwhelming for me. And I know now from experience and research that we also that that's how addicts function. It's like and now instead of seeing it as like, oh, my God, I'm so fucked up like that. I'm just embracing it. I'm like, it's a beautiful side of me, you know. Yeah. <laughs> unfortunately she's half french so she has to do her taxes in france which is impossible for any normal human being because they still use doves to send letters <laughs> <laughs> just, when yeah. i met her she, <laughs> no. she had a checkbook i had never in my life seen a checkbook like a paper checkbook where you're like hi i'm gonna go to the store buy one uh, one bottle of coke please thank you yeah cool wait can i write a check wait what well, it's too, it's twenty twenty two, no, and and that's and that also when you it kind of shows where my head was at because it's like why the fuck would I bring a checkbook to Mexico? Like why would I ever need that to ever? like take the paper and roll it? Yeah, for a straw. No, I know, <laughs> but it's like just like what? Like I had zero clarity of mind. Like I don't know. It was... Yeah, we definitely had some moments of clarity and some moments of absolute non clarity, but. You know, weird way we managed to first of all survive. I almost died. You almost would have died. I mean, if it's not a big secret, she was headed to Colombia on a one-way ticket. Yeah, I mean, my like I said, and I and I share this in meetings and stuff. Like my goal quickly shifted to actually just wanting to die and self-destruct. It was like that was my only goal, and I don't understand how it got so dark so fast because it's like I had tunnel vision and I was just like, okay, fuck myself up and die like. And that, that's also another thing that I hear in meetings and stuff. It's that beautiful, fucking tragic fantasy. Like, a lot of alcoholics and addicts have this death fantasy where it's like, you know, dying fucking in this dramatic way, like relapsing and dying. And it's like, it's so frustrating, but it's there. You know, yeah. I mean, catch me on a bad day when I'm like tired and hungry and like not spiritually fit. That thought comes back. That thought yeah. comes back where it's like, hey... You can just get on a flight, go to Colombia and still fulfill that fantasy. And then it's like, oh, it's like so much hard work. Just 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 not having those thoughts. But also, yeah, being in recovery is also just understanding that those thoughts will come and yeah. that I just have to let them pass as fast as how they came. And embracing it, accepting it and coping with it is, I think, well, there's not many other solutions. I mean, if anyone's an addict or like in recovery or struggling with addiction it's like 
you know, you gotta stop fighting it at one point and just. I mean, there's it. a reason why why AA meetings start with "Hi, my name is Bum Bum, and yeah. I'm an alcoholic or whatever it is." Well, yeah, because first of all, you need to remind yourself of like what you are, and yeah. I understand the whole things of labels and like you don't want to keep keep yourself like consider yourself a sick person all the time. I fully understand, but it's like. If you start getting confident, if I start getting confident and being like, oh, yeah, you know, not not identifying anymore as someone with addiction problems, then I'm fucked. Yeah. Because I cannot forget where I've come from. Because the, the difference, the difference, let's say, for someone like me and someone like you, I like I don't have any of the like childhood trauma and the crazy shit that you've had. Loving family, loads of people, everyone's happy, parents still together, like the opposite of your past. And... <laughs> When I got like pulled into the whole thing of where we were, I also started questioning like, am I an addict? Mm-hmm. Am I addicted? Yeah. Do I have problems with alcohol? Do I have problems with, I don't know, cocaine or MDMA or ecstasy or mm-hmm. whatever? And there were moments where I really needed to consider because I didn't know anymore because I also knew that I'd done enough to lose pers- accurate perspective. Mm-hmm. And if I understand, okay. I cannot trust what I think anymore and I cannot trust what I feel anymore. I got to just pull out and reset mm-hmm. because it's, there's, there's no other way. Yeah. However, I know that for me, it's like there's always this analytical, even at my worst of worst moments, there's this analytical side somewhere. Mm-hmm. And even when I started experiment, experimenting with drugs, which was really late, I was 28, I think. Like I had a set of rules that I was supposed to follow, mm-hmm. which was you only do it with right people, right quantity, the right drug, and the right environment. Mm -hmm. And if you have all of those things, go for it. And then in the beginning, it was great. But like Mexico was the issue when everything kind of spiraled out because, Mm -hmm. well, cocaine is so easily available. And I don't even like cocaine, but it was so just available. And when you do coke, you drink. And when you drink, you do more coke. And I really, really don't like drugs that give you something too easy, but also train repetitive behavior. Yeah. So like if you drink beer even, you, you empty the glass, you need another one. You empty the glass, you need another one. If you take a line of coke, 20-30 mm. minutes later, you want another one. So it's constantly like the difference with psychedelics, for example. You do LSD. Mm. <laughs> you are done with LSD before LSD is done with you. Yeah. Literally. And you're like 14 hours later, you're like, oh. It's like, it, that's an experience yeah. that's eye-opening and like life-changing. Yeah. And after that, you're like, oh, I don't want to do it for some time anymore. Yeah. Like you get so much out of it. But something like Coke mm-hmm. and alcohol is the opposite. Mm-hmm. Simple rule. Doesn't matter how much Coke you have. It'll never be enough. <laughs> yeah. And you, you can have one bag. It will be done by the morning. You can have 10 bags. It will be done by the morning. Yeah. You're not going to rationalize the quantities. No. So that's the danger in it. So I think, yeah, the, the, the difference where, where I wanted to get with this, I think, was that, oh, yeah, that I... I had the behavior mm. that might have looked that I'm, I have issues with addiction. But the difference is that I don't have your past or I don't have the past of an addict. My, like, my brain, like I did anything first time 28, right? Mm. You were really young. You were still doing, you started doing things when your brain was in full development, super important years. Mm-hmm. So part of your brain developed differently, right? So it's like in you, there's a, biological difference mm-hmm. with how alcohol hits you yeah compared to me mm-hmm. i remember i thought that you were an addict at some point i was like this guy is in full denial like he just doesn't know that he's an addict but you know things have shown other otherwise and also it's not it, it's not my like even if you were one it's it's not m- my thing to judge at all like you know that would well, that we would both be did the you. same thing that i portrayed i projected on you mm. As if you were, you had the same qualities as me. Right. It's like, you're not an addict. You're just an obsessive behavior yeah. and you can stop. It's just the strength of mind. You can just make the decision and stop. Mm-hmm. Right. That's what I thought about addiction also. Yeah. And then you, mm-hmm. you saw similar behavior in me and you were like, well, he's clearly addic- addicted, yeah. but he's just in full denial. Exactly. So it's just like portraying on the other person what, how you see it or, mm-hmm. or almost kind of like how it would fit you. Yeah, exactly. I literally have talked to people and they don't even accept in their head that alcohol is a drug. Mm. They, if you say drug, they think like heroin, cocaine, all the dangerous stuff. Alcohol, in my head, is the worst drug that mm. I've tried. Yeah. 
by far the worst dr drug that I've tried because it's the same repetitive behavior, more, more, more. It's, it's dangerous because people don't think it's a drug. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, socializing and, and, and partying and we get super fucked up and you start super early when you're like 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Yeah. And it's supported by your fucking parents mm -hmm. often. If anything, offered by your parents. Imagine if you're like 14 and then your dad comes, ah, here's a line of coke. Oh, that's crazy. And your dad comes like, oh, here's like, have your first beer, you're a man. Yeah. Alcohol has somehow managed to... Legalize itself. <laughs> yeah, legalize. I mean, it's been around for like yeah, thousands yeah, no, of, of years. But the fact that people don't identify it as a drug mm -hmm. makes it so dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I like to ask people now, after I got really into the topic of addiction and everything, I don't ask anymore, hey, like, are you addicted to anything or like whatever. I just like to go straight up to what are you addicted to? Mm -hmm. And the answer for most people is like nothing. What do you mean? And then I'm like, well, do you drink coffee? They're like, yeah. How often? Every day. How many times? Three times a day. Mm -hmm. Well, addicted. Yeah. And then they're like, why don't you stop? I don't want to. Well, try. And even if they try, they can't. They go straight to withdrawal. Yeah. And that's literally ABCs of being an addict. Yeah. If you're listening to this, the question to you is, what are you addicted to? Before we finish this, I wanted to ask you if someone is listening and maybe some parts of the talk maybe hit hard when it was whether it was relationships or having a partner that's an addict or or being alone in your addiction or anything like that what would you say to a person that is maybe struggling with addiction and is listening to this because i guess there's a lot of solitude and being alone in addiction mm. i mean it's cliche as fuck but the first thing i would say is that you're not alone <laughs> there's so many fucking people out there that <clears throat> struggle with this and like the biggest thing I think people have to ask themselves and this no one else can ask yourself this but it's like do you want to get out of it do you want to stop or not and if you don't that's totally fine to a certain extent but like don't bring other people in like and if you do then are you willing to go to any length to stop because if you're not ready, to, if you if you're ready to half ass recovery, then there's no point. Like, I'm sorry to cut it, you know, straight, yeah. but it's like you're going to have to understand that for a certain amount of time, at least for the beginning, you're going to have to drastically shift your way of thinking, your way of doing the people you hang out with, like everything. So it's like, know that you're not alone, but also ask yourself, are you really ready to change? And are you willing, willing to go to any length to get it? Are you, you know, and Everyone has their own ways of dealing, of being in recovery and, you know, what might work for me might not work for you. But if you really want it, you have to go find the things that work for you. There's, there's so many people that are struggling with the same problems. doesn't matter what the problem is. Like, we're human beings. Seven mm -hmm. and a half billion people. Whatever problem you have that you feel that you're alone in, you're not alone. It's just that people don't want to talk about their problems. So it's very hard to find people that share your problems. Mm -hmm. So that's why like AA meetings or stuff like that is super important because you can just go online and find a bunch of people yeah. where you know that they have the same issues. And for me, it was it just opened my eyes to that world in a way that I went to one of the AA meetings with you. Mm -hmm. And it's like, they're all different people, different age, different gender. Mm -hmm. And how they speak about it is almost identical. The stories yeah. that I heard were like copy paste to us. Yeah. Right? And, and then you understand that the problem almost makes the people behave in such a similar way mm -hmm. that it's like, it's just against all odds. Yeah. That thousands and thousands and millions of people would just almost become like brothers and sisters identical. No, exactly. I mean, but it's because they share the same problem. Yeah. And it's so much better to hang around with people like that, talk, talk to people like that because they're constantly trying to overcome what yeah. you're trying to overcome. If you want to become a musician, hang out with musicians. Mm -hmm. If you want to become a fucking doctor, Find people that are already doing what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And if you want to overcome being an alcoholic or, or drug addiction or whatever, find people that have done it or who are doing it. Yeah. Like, I think one of the biggest things of, of being human, you know, let alone an addict, is just that human beings need their social groups and in, and they need their social groups because they need to identify with other human, human beings, you know, yeah. that there needs to be that sense of like re relatability, you know, camaraderie. Yeah, but like being able to identify yeah. with someone else just so you know you're not alone and 
And for me, I found that these 12 step fellowships like AA, NA, SA, all of these different fellowships, there's CA even for a go Like there's literally, there's even EA, Emotions Anonymous. And I recently discovered this. And I was like, I definitely should be in that. But, you know, like that's why these fellowships are, are just so be- beautiful and free. And, you know, a lot of people will consider it a cult or religion and whatever the fuck. But it's like, put all your prejudices aside. Like, put all the stereotypes aside and just go go figure out what works for you. Yeah. that That's all I can say. And I, I can't say what's going to work for you. I can only speak about my experience. But, yeah, for me, that's what's been working for me. And, I mean, there's I could go on and on about, like, what I do now on a daily basis that works for that's me. That's going to be podcast number two. That's also and also true. about prejudice. If you, if you identify and you accept that you have problem with addiction, and then, let's say, you hear from this podcast, like, maybe you should consider AA or something. And then you have a, some form of like, fuck that. I don't want to go to AA. I'm not one of those people. Mm-hmm. It's like, if you can still afford to have an excuse or prejudice, you're clearly not taking the issue at face value. Not at face value, but you're not taking the issue for what it is. Because yeah. you still think that it's manageable without any effort. Yeah, or help. Or help. But mm-hmm. it's like, my advice would be, and just coming from a partner or a boyfriend that saw it from a side, mm-hmm. It's, it will take you down. It takes the people around you down. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if you don't think that you need to manage it, Mm -hmm. but when it comes out in a way that you physically start to look sick, then you're already at a point where you cannot hide it anymore. Mm -hmm. And from there, it's like, it's super difficult because now your problem is out and you're going to be judged by your loved ones by a problem that they don't understand. Just one, one last thing as a gentle reminder that like a lot of a lot of alcoholics and addicts or whatever they they think that they haven't hit their rock bottom yet you know that they can continue for a bit longer they're like oh yeah i'm not as bad as this one or that one and i was definitely like that can level up yet yeah but just remember that like rock bottom is when you stop digging you know it doesn't have you don't have to reach that point of like losing your house your husband your kids like all your money blah 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 it, you know it just it's when you decide to stop when you're tired of that like mental fatigue when you're tired of being sick and tired, like it just it doesn't have to get to a really bad material bottom. Yeah. It's just when you stop stop digging that hole for yourself. So I guess rock bottom, think about that. Rock bottom comes with honesty. Like honesty and self reflection in a way yeah, that if you just your, start yourself. if you just stop if you stop creating illusions of what's happening and what's become of you. Yeah. And then you have a glimpse of honesty and immediately and when you actually see yourself, then you're like like, I had that moment. What mm. changed it for me was when we were in Tallinn. Mm-hmm. We had that massive fucking fight and, like, we almost broke up and everything. I remember the next day I just looked in the mirror and I was like, I look like a fucking junkie. Mm. That's it. Like, there was no, I haven't slept enough. Oh, I've lost a lot of weight. But yeah, yeah, because it's the travel and everything. I was just like, I look like a fucking junkie. And I was done. Mm. It didn't matter that if I actually did, it didn't matter if, you know, what mm-hmm. was the reality of the situation? There's always an excuse for everything, but yeah. the two seconds, one sentence, and I accepted that as truth. And after that, it was like, poof, it's over. And that, uh, that now, I mean, I heard this not long ago in a meeting, but like what you had then was like, well, what we consider a moment of clarity. Yeah. And like these moments of clarity is, or, you know, some people might say they're God shots or moments of God or whatever the fuck, but these moments of clarity, it's like, you don't get them every single day when you're in a dark loop. You don't get them every single after at every single hangover. Yeah. Some maybe do or not, but it's like, just visualize yourself as being like in an elevator, you know, and you don't know when it's going to stop or when it stops and the doors open, that's your moment of clarity. And this thing with this elevator, it's not going up, it's going down. Yeah. So it's like, whenever you get the doors that open, it's like, seize it. Cause those moments of clarity are not going to last forever. Cause you're eventually yeah. going to, well, hit the bottom. I also think life life will give you a limited amount of chances exactly. to get out. It's exactly. not like you can just... No, just, don't take it for granted. Yeah, life life will... As addiction aside, life will test you on other levels as well. Mm-hmm. Your loved ones will die. Something will mm-hmm. happen. You have a dog. The dog gets hit by a car. It's not, and then if you're addicted or you're on the way of being addicted and something really bad happens to you, Mm -hmm. that's going to trigger you probably to find a solution in the addiction and just amplify that. So life is going to hit you from left, right, up and down. Mm -hmm. And to have the danger of something like an addiction lurking around, it's going to take over. Yeah. So on that happy thought, I think it's time to wrap up. Yes. And uh, 
I think this was one of the best conversations I've ever had with an ex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Will you marry me? Again? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was another guy. Mm. Yeah, but anyways, thanks for listening. Thank you for having me as a as a guest. Yeah, do you want to promote yourself or something like Instagram and stuff to be found? Because you do do the sober oh. stuff. Well, I mean, I'm quite public about my sobriety and recovery. So if you do want to connect with me, I'm super happy to do so over Instagram. I can put the links. Yeah, on, yeah, yeah. Because on... if I say it out loud, people are just going to remember Lemon. So <laughs> <laughs> That's no true. Point. Um, but yeah, you know, like I said, I'm I literally am the furthest person to judge anyone about anything. So if you feel like you want to reach out, you know, I'm happy to, to chat or whatever. So yeah, just drop me a message. And um, well, thank yeah. you for listening. I'll put all the links in the description and... I think it's a wrap. Episode yes. number two done. Thank you for done. taking the time. And now and we're going to see Peterson. Now we're off to seeing Jordan Peterson, yes. who was a big part of helping both of us get out of this, yeah. by the yeah, way. Yeah, fucking hell. That would be a whole separate Shout episode. out to Peterson. Yeah, shout out to JB, boy. Yeah. yeah. Also boy. JC. Jesus Christ. <laughs> or JMC. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, same initials. I mean, we must be holy we in all holy. of the darkness yeah. that we did. Okay. Holy Trinity. Okay. Thanks, guys. We're gonna go and not have sex now. No. Bye. Bye. <laughs>